So hi everyone, uh, welcome to the uh, ICTS String Seminar. So today we are happy to have Andreas Karch from Texas Austin, who will be talking to us about a top-down dictionary for double holography. So over to you, Andreas. Thank you very much for the invitation and uh, thanks for you know, moving your seminar to a time that's a little bit more convenient for me. Um, so this work I want to talk about today is from like last summer and this is a paper that I wrote with Christoph Uhlemann, who is in Oxford and probably moves to Brussels soon and uh, how your son, our postdoc here, Judy Orton. And um, before I tell you about top-down approaches, I need to kind of give you a lighting review of double holography. I, I think I talked about this even you know, at ICTS before. But um, just to make sure we're all on the same page. No, that was too fast. So um, the, the main workhorse here is going to be Randall Sundrum brains. And uh, what, what Randall Sundrum brains are, quick reminder, they're a simple solution to Einstein equations where the matter is just a thin sheet that carries some sort of constant energy density. So depending on this energy density or tension, the world volume ends up having either an effective negative zero or positive positive cosmological constant. You can think of this as being some sort of balance between some sort of negative cosmological constant, which I'll have around the Randall Sandrum brain and a positive cosmological constant on the brain. And from the brain, the geometry is just ADS. So we're doing this all in the background ADS space. Mm -hmm. What's interesting about them is that if you study linearized fluctuations around the solution, you see that this brain has a trapped graviton on the brain. The, the graviton is massive, if I'm in the case of an effective negative cosmological constant, and this massless otherwise. Um, in the end, this is how these space times look like. Since away from the brain, I just have ADS, the space time ends up being sort of some part of ADS that's truncated by the brain. And here I have sort of either, you can think of these as constant time slices through like ADS and global coordinates. So ADS is the cylinder, this is like a disk that's like one slice of the cylinder. Or you can simply think of this as Euclidean ADS. And then you see that the um, you have to hear this Miskowski brain, I call this the critical brain, and you have the subcritical one and um, the critical one, the ADS brain, and uh, the overcritical one, the decidual brain. And kind of make these pictures a little bit more easy to understand, let's start with the critical case. Right? So what I'm depicting here is the line, the purple line, that's where the brain is sitting in ADS. And then to get the full Randall Sandrum solution, what I would do, I would remove the purple shaded part and then to find the full solution of GR, what I basically would do is I would take two copies of the white region and glue them together along the brain. I do this so that the metric itself is continuous, but clearly there's some discontinuity there. Those two don't fit smoothly together, that there's a jump in extrinsic curvature. And that jump in extrinsic curvature is exactly what's supported by the brain. Um, it's more common to kind of not having to deal with two copies of the wide region. So often we're going to do what's called an orbifolded RS space time, where there's a C2 symmetry that maps these two wide regions into each other. You can orbifold by this. And then you end up with a space time which is simply like a part of ADS, the wide region of ADS I keep, and it ends on the brain. And here's the, you know, the my original picture was the global picture. If I do this in Poincaré patch coordinate, this looks like at the bottom right. I simply have a brain that removes the entire UV region of ADS, including the full boundary, and it keeps the infrared. So if these random sundown brains, because they're embedded in ADS, they come with a natural holographic interpretation. Um, and just you know, this is doing in words what the picture said before, right? Remember, holography says that like ADS gravity on ADS five should have some holographic description in terms of a, some CFT. The CFT lives on the boundary. And the way the fifth dimension is encoded is in some energy scale, what's near the boundary is the UV, what's deep inside the bulk, that's the IR of the picture. So holographically, you would just look at this picture and say, well, what I did is I take two copies of the infrared part of ADS. So if I orbifold, which I'll mostly do in this talk, I just get one copy of the infrared part of ADS, and then it ends on this three plus one dimensional brain with a massless graviton trapped on the brain. You go in and say word by word the same things in the dual language. So I have a four-dimensional CFD if I look at the orbifolded space time, but I somehow removed the, the UV part. So the UV, there's a UV cutoff on the CFD. And then for the CFD with UV cutoff, nowhere inside is a dynamical 4D graviton. So the proposal that people made is that, well, holographically, since there's a 4D graviton from the bulk point of view, they got to be one in the dual point of view. So somehow if you edit this brain, you edit four-dimensional gravity explicitly by hand as part of the dual picture. So the proposal is that the dual to this RS brain world is a 4D CFD with UV cutoff 
coupled to dynamical gravity. Dynamical gravity becomes part of the dual. There's dynamical gravity on both sides. 5D gravity on this RS main world is 4D gravity coupled to a 4D CFT. The space time became CFT, but the 4D graviton is explicitly there on both sides. This becomes even more interesting if you look at the subcritical case. In the subcritical case, you see what's new now is the brain you know, intersects the original boundary. So instead of removing the original boundary completely, we are keeping half of the original boundary. And in my blue box over there is how this looks like if you zoom in on the concave slicing. So what we are this time doing, I'm having a space time where again, I'm removing some sort of wedge and I'm keeping half the original boundary. This is basically telling you that this time you don't just have two, but in fact, three descriptions you can choose from. You can always you know, use the bulk, but then there's two dual description as I'll review in a second. And um, that goes by the name double holography. Right? So you see, you have ADS CFT where like the boundary theory itself has a boundary. And also massive gravity features prominently in them. Let me quickly talk about this double holography using the zoomed in picture of the Poincare patch. So you know, one, one description we always have is we can just study classical gravity in the bulk, right? And the bulk have bulk and brain, and I can answer anything I want to know by just solving Einstein's equation. If I follow the same logic as in the critical case, you'd go in, well, I can think of you know, my original boundary as two half spaces that meet at a you no, know, an interface of so two, you no, know, forty half spaces meeting at a three D interface, say for concreteness. And what I did is on one half of space, the right half of space, I introduced the standard Randall Sundon brain. So I, you no, know, introduced the cutoff for my CFT because I removed that blue wedge on the right, and there's a graviton that's trapped on the brain. So I have on the right hand side, I end up getting a forty CFT with a cutoff living on ADS four coupled to dynamical forty gravity. But that's this time not the end of the story. I still have over here the red half of the original boundary. So this 4D CFT living on ADS4 with gravity is communicating to a 4D CFT that's also living on half space, but this time without gravity. The two communicate with each other via boundary conditions at this shared interface. So I have this like you no know, standard IS description, I would say, where you have gravity plus CFT on ADS-4, but this time it's communicating with some non-gravitation CFT on half space. And that you, know, you can refer to as a heat bath. Right? It's an external bath with which ADS-4 gravity can communicate. Last but not least, you can just say, forget about like brains and graviton straps at brains. If I just look at this from the standard ADS-CFT point of view, I have a boundary which is half space and that boundary should capture everything. So I have a boundary conformal field to be a 4D CFT with a 3D boundary. And that alone should be dual to everything I have in here. And you can easily see how the second and the third description go with each other, right? If I kind of go into this 4D CFD with a 3D boundary, basically what I did in order to get to this intermediate standard RS picture, I took the 3D CFD and I only dualized the degrees of freedom of the 3D CFD. So you can think of the degrees of freedom on the brain. There's a 4D CFD living on the brain coupled to 4D gravity. That's the dual to only the 3D CFD. That's kind of the boundary of the 4DB CFD. Whereas if I take the entire 5D space time, that's the dual to the entire B CFD. And that philosophy will become incredibly important later in my talk. So we have the, the, just the geometry of this brain world suggests three dual descriptions. And um, you no, know, we have a B CFD, we have a gravity plus bass, and we have classical gravity. Furthermore, no, as I mentioned before, the gravity on this scenario is um, massive. That's usually a story I really like to tell about, but no, not today since we have another agenda. But no, just know that this gravity on mass can be understood from all three different dual perspectives. In the story I just told you, the, the part that's maybe the most iffy is this intermediate picture, right? This was just this assertion that because in the bulk we found the localized gravity on there has to exist a dual description where gravity is explicitly part of the dual description. And you might wonder when is this actually valid and what is the dictionary I should use and actually in order to understand this. Right? It was sort of just suggested by looking at the picture and seeing that you, know, you somehow need this 4D gravity and probably should add it by hand. Here's one proposed dictionary that was something Dominic Neuenfeld came out with like two years ago. And it goes something like this. Right? So if you look at this diagram, in the red part where I have just the original boundary of ADS, any bulk field X has a standard near boundary expansion. If I look at the brain, 
the brain is basically like a UV cutoff um, for the CFD. And uh, if you kind of have a tension that's very close to the critical value, so this blue you know, diagonal brain is very near the boundary, then this is sort of a small UV cutoff, right? Small compared to the ADS4 curvature radius on the, this, on, on the brain. Sort of, uh, you would say that X and all its derivatives take finite values, but they have the standard expansion in terms of epsilon. So um, let's look at the two ends both at a time, right? And uh, where I have the standard ADS boundary, I run to all the same issues I always do in ADS. There's an infinite amount of volume sitting near the ADS boundary. So I need to introduce by hand the UV cutoff class to get finite answers. And then I apply the standard rules of ADCFD. I regulate by introducing this cutoff. I add some counter terms to get renormalized action. And then I can calculate expectation values, say, of the stress tensor by varying this. Um, we normalized action with respect to the you know, value of the metric on the cutoff slice. Over here on the brain, I do almost the same, but I have a different interpretation. But again, I introduce some finite cutoff epsilon, but on the brain side, the finite cutoff epsilon is given to me by the physical setup, right? Instead of by hand introducing a cutoff as some sort of theoretical device in order to get finite values, in the end, I take the cutoff to zero. This time the cutoff is physical. There's a brain sitting there and it's removing part of space time. So epsilon is not some imaginary fictitious parameter that I want to send to zero, but it's something finite that's baked into my setup. It's set by the brain tension. So this time you would say the regulate, you know, the full on-shell action is just you know, whatever you get from the regulated bulk action, which you can also just call the bulk action that kind of you integrate up to the brain. And then you get some extra terms that come from the action on the brain. But nobody stops you from adding and subtracting counter terms. And that's sort of the heart of Dominic's procedure. He just said, take this and you know, go back in and add the counter terms that you always like to add and then subtract them again. So that clearly I didn't do anything. But now we can look at the two pieces one at a time. You'd be saying, what I get the first term here, the regulated action plus the counter terms, that's the standard S matter. If I vary this with respect to the metric, I get my standard recipe for the stress tensor, you know, which I got with a finite cutoff. So I get the stress tensor. The first thing is because I don't take the cutoff to zero, right? This is the stress, the expectation value of the stress tensor in the presence of a finite cutoff. And then I look at the second term, what happens here, right? I get S brain minus S counter terms. These counter terms, among other things, contain the Ricci scalar. So I, I vary a term, an action that contains the Ricci scalar with respect to the metric. So that gives me the Einstein-Hilbert term. And then in the end, I want to have, if I demanded the variation of this with respect to the metric on the brain, which is now a dynamical object, because my brain is no longer some sort of fictitious device where I specify boundary values, but the metric on the brain is a dynamical object. And varying this action with respect to the metric just gives me the standard Einstein equations where the second two terms give me you know, the Einstein-Hilbert term in the action. And the first two terms give me the expectation value of this question. So if this was Dominic's recipe, uh, gives a seemingly sensory dictionary where you get indeed you know, dynamical gravity coupled to a CFT with cut off on the brain. Uh, you can quantitatively check that it reproduces the right graviton mass at small epsilon, but intrinsically relies on the epsilon expansion. So if this dictionary at all makes sense, it only makes sense when the brain tension is very near its critical limit. And uh, it doesn't help us deciding whether the duality is true to begin with or not. Right? If the duality is true, this seems to be a, a meaningful story to tell that this is how you would calculate it. So all seemed nice and good until like a paper that came out by near, now a year and a half ago, which uh, by Omiya and Wei, who presented some significant challenges to this whole idea of intermediate holography. And they pointed out this is really a kind of trivial calculation. People should have seen this before. There, there are some Significant issues with causality if you believe in this intermediate picture. The basic idea is what I have here in pictures. You kind of try to calculate a correlation function with one insertion in the bars and one insertion on the brain. Right? And from the point of view of this intermediate picture, the causality should be dominated by the distance between you know, point in the bars and point on the brain in this intermediate picture geometry. So I walk along the red boundary, I communicate at the interface, and then I walk along the brain to get down to the brain. But you might wonder if I just look at this picture, it looks like it may be shorter to go through the bulk. And in fact, it is. You can calculate the time difference it takes walking along the boundary and the brain where that's going through the bulk. And the important thing is like the first one is sort of the time it takes long boundary and brain. The second one is the time it goes through the bulk. 
and uh, the time along the boundary and brain it's longer so you, you you can if you believe in this intermediate picture you found some causality violation because of the dual bulk description you find that the time it takes to communicate from like a point of the bias which they call yr the point of the brain yp is uh, so the time in the bulk is shorter than the time along the boundary and the distance is proportional to both the distance along the brain and the distance along the bars. And it's set by the angle of the brain, so by the brain tension. The important thing is this time difference does, in fact, go to zero if you go near the critical tension. Which in this coordinate, or this choice of coordinates, the critical tension would correspond to new starting point. So in the critical limit, the shortcut vanishes. So maybe one can sort of rescue Neuenfeld's prescription. I, I don't think this has been made precise. Because both you know, his effects and the shortcut are sort of leading order and epsilon, one would want to kind of see whether one can cook up a dictionary where one can avoid causality violations, sort of maybe up to the next to leading order. Um, it's also the fact that this depends on the product of yp and yr means that you can't really locally mess around with anything in the on the brain and try to cook up a better description on the brain because whatever you do on the brain in order to cure the shortcut. You would have to do it in a way that knows about the point on the boundary at which you want to observe the signal. So it would have to be something highly non-local, where you modify what you mean by sources on the brain in a way that depends on a boundary point. There's no causality problem in the BCFT dual, right? If you say, well, I don't care about this intermediate picture, the intermediate picture is just bogus. I want to say this whole brain setup is dual to a BCFT you're fine. There's nothing wrong with this, right? In the BCFD, if you put both sources out on the boundary, you don't get a causality violation. You only get causality violation if you put one source on the brain. Okay, um, so, you no. Know, what, what's the problem now? Don't we have some explicit contradiction? Well, I, I, I've been talking about Randall Sandman brains, and Randall Sandman brains are not part of string theory, right? Sort of, I'm, I'm giving holographic words for something that may not have to have a holographic interpretation. Right? These are sort of all known brains in string theory. You might think, well, at low energies, their tension should dominate because it's the leading term in the derivative expansion. But the problem is that brains in string theory, they, they do other things. They don't just have attention. They source other fields, right? They source like the supersymmetric brain source from mont Ramon fields. Um, or even the non-supersymmetric ones typically source the diloton. So it's just not true that for a brain you get out of string theory, the brain you know, leaves space time to be ADS untouched from the brain and only glues it together in a non-trivial way. Brains in string theory aren't like this. So can I uh, can I ask a question, Andreas, before you go on to your motivation? So the question is, uh, in this causality violation, it was important that there was some assumption that there was some extrapolate dictionary which held in the intermediate picture, right? So one could, in principle, uh, I mean, isn't that? Yeah, so, so right. Um, no, one, one could. I think there's still an option that maybe one can modify the dictionary. Uh, I, I still know. I mean, we talked about this before, but the fact that the, the shortcut is reported by P by R still, I think, makes it very difficult. I mean, we try it, but no, I, I never like telling people it won't work because, no, I mean, uh, oh, oh, it might well be that one can rescue this. I, I tell you a different story today. I tell you a different okay. way of, but maybe there's some other way of doing this. Okay, I, I, okay, okay, thank you, yeah. Um, if you do string theory, you know, kind of want to find when the Sandman brains and string theory, they're, they're, they're not really brains. They're, they're not, string theory had lots of brains, like deep brains and stuff like this, and S brains. That's not what when the Sandman brain is. When the Sandman brain in the low energy setting is always a stand in for something more complicated than string theory. For example, for the critical RS brain, the, there have, has been a well known description where, like, the UV brain, the thing that I just showed you, is some sort of well, Linda tells you you can monkey up an F theory compactification this way. You have some F-theory compactification where you have like a lot of three brains that are required for normally cancellation sitting on top of it, each other. So you have like six dimension manifold where you pull out some ADS five times S5 throw, which naturally has a finite length. So it's some complicated geometry that you can kind of make look like in RS brain. The RS brain you know, reproduces qualitative features. Many RS setups have also some negative tension brain that truncates the geometry in the IR that would be sort of a clever no stress like cascading. So, so you can kind of model some complicated strings here compactification by yeah. RS brains. And they, and they reproduce qualitative features, not necessarily quantitative. So you might wonder how does intermediate holography work? Um, 
in the UV complete version of ADSB CFT, can we find maybe a meaningful dictionary there? Right? If I if I'm in string C, I should better find a consistent answer. Sorry, so how, can, I ask, yeah. can I ask one more question about the causality uh, yes. problem? Trying to understand something. So, is it uh, enough what you said to to? Uh, can we go the extra step and show that you can build a time machine with this? Because there's 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 situations in which let's say you don't know there's some particle in your theory and you believe the light cone is small the maximum velocity is smaller then you would say ah but i can go faster right i can see, i don't know i take qed and i integrate out the photons then i only see the electrons the theory is non local but it's still causal there's no there's no problem with causality the, the photons you're just not seeing so in other words, in in, uh, in Lorentz invariant theories, we we know how to go between the two things because we can do a, a Lorentz transformation and change a causality a relation between two events. Here, how does it work? Is it not just that there's yeah? Some, I think the calculation that's been done is only the one that I described to you. This is like a much more sophisticated um, no consideration that people have done. So you, you're saying maybe I can trade the a causality with non-locality, and non-locality is something I can easier live with, right? That's what you're saying. Yes. I don't, I don't know, maybe. So the calculation that has been done is about showing that the light like GUD6 to the bulk takes, you know, arrives before one that goes along the bound. Okay, but there's still going to be a causal ordering of these events through the bulk, right? Because those light like GUD6 have a light cone in the bulk, so you're not going to be able to build time machines in this setup. At least not, I don't see how. Yeah, there's some ordering, but that ordering looks unnatural from the point of view of the right. field. Okay, thank you. Maybe, so you're saying maybe I, instead of a causality, one has non-locality. That would still be different from what people had in mind. It's also different from what I'm about to tell you, but maybe. See that, no, Lisa thinks so, so you would make Lisa Randall very happy if you find a consistent interpretation where you cook up a, a non-local theory that's dual and works. Okay, thank you. So here I was, I wanted to build for you a top-down version of this, and then we want to understand this whole thing in top-down. And you'll be seeing in the top-down picture, I'll basically be punting. I'll tell you, okay, I don't know how to make the original thing work, but I tell you something else that works and gives me the same answers. So uh, no, the, if you find a better version of making it work directly, good for you. Uh, I think that's still the verdict, and this is still out. But, but here, let me build my top-down PCFD. And I, you, you start with your favorite holographic CFD, right? Sort of. At least for those of us who've been around for a while, this isn't SYK and JT, but that's sort of n equals four Sylvian wheels with its ADS5 times S5 tool. Right? So we, we take a stack of these three brains and um, we get n equals four Sylvian wheels and the dual is ADS5 times S5. And I'm about to describe up here, I have a bunch of references. Of course, that's not references for n equals four Sylvian wheels, but these are people who build this top entire top down concept. I want to have a BCFT, so I need to take n equals four zero mils, and I need to put it in half space, so my three brains have to end on something. And you no, know, these three brains can end in a supersymmetric way, so I have lots of control on ns five brains or d five brains. So now we have you no know, n equals four zero mils on half space, but this isn't quite yet what I want because if I look at this based on my boundary conditions, which this is like every field either based directly or Neumann boundary conditions, sort of my boundary is entirely trivial. There's no degree of freedom living on the boundary. And from the, what I told you before, the fact that we get like 40 gravity on ADS4, this was related to the fact that I sort of can individually dualize this 3D boundary. What I want for like a double holographic setting, I don't just want an N equals 4 to variables with a large number of colors in the bulk. I also want somehow lots of degrees of freedom on the boundary. So the boundary itself is going to be some highly non trivial 3D CFD. So NS5 frames and D5 frames are good, but I somehow need to have many of them. And Here's a way of doing this. This has been taught to us a long time ago by Hanani and Witten, and then kind of analyzed in all gory detail by Gayoto and Witten. We get like the most general boundary condition that preserves half supersymmetry for any source of young mills. You don't just end them on a single NS5 frame, but sort of on some sandwich made out of NS5 frames with snippets of these three frames, you know, stretched between them and intersected by the five frames. So I have here, like, I pulled this apart for you so I can draw a picture. But really, this entire stack of five brains and three brains, you all squish this together to like, basically, they're all lying on top of each other. So I have like this network of you know, these three brains stretched between NS5 brains and D5 brains. And that thing 
itself gives me some non-trivial 3D CFT. There are some constraints on the numbers of frames stretched on any given interval, so that this becomes what people call a balance, or what Coyote and Britain call a balance driven, which is like the requirement that you basically just get a 3D CFT and nothing else. It's nicely flows to some interacting 3D CFT. And then the 3D CFT serves as the boundary of n equals false different mills on half space. And you see, I can basically roughly independently dial the 40 degrees of freedom and the 3D degrees of freedom. The 40 degrees of freedom are just given by the number of three brains I had. The 3D degrees of freedom are given by like how many five brains and three brains I put into the center. This is a very concrete CFT you can write down, right? Sort of, yes, you can write this in terms of this quiver gauge zero language. So these, all these U's, these are like three dimensional gauge groups. One of them has a bunch of fundamental flavors. The vertical at uh, the horizontal lines that connect them, these are bifundamental matter. So I got hypermultiplets which are charged on the neighboring gauge groups. The middle gauge group, the biggest one, has an extra fundamental flavor which correspond to D5 frames. And then this whole thing becomes a 3D CFT. And then the very last node, the one which has a hat on top of it, that's a 4D gauge theory. That's why it has a slightly different notation. So I get a 4D gauge theory living on half space coupled to a product. 3D gauge 3, which is sort of driven to its infrared fixed point. So the coupling constant flows to infinity. But this is some 3D CFT, which has some you know, gauge 3 description, the infrared fixed point of this particular gauge 3. I can express everything in terms of two numbers, N5 and K. But really, the, you know, for the today's talk, I call this N5, 2N5K, I call N because that's sort of the SUN of the 4D gauge 3. And I know here R and S are just some sort of derived quantities in terms of um, N5 and K. But now if you look at the diagram with the brains, you see better what's going on, right? So the number of three brains grows till you get the biggest gauge group in the middle, and then it shrinks again until you go over to N equals four surroundings. This is the picture when N5 is bigger than 2K. There's a slightly different picture when 2K is less than N5, but uh, I'm, I'm going to stick for today only for that case. And our paper, you can also look at it. So um, how does this coupling work between you know, how is the 3D boundary talking to the 4D bulk? It's very easy in this picture, right? The 3D CFT itself has some SUN global symmetry. And um, the N equals 4 Sigma mils in half space, you impose Neumann boundary conditions for the gauge field. So it has some SUN gauge symmetry. And then the way the two talk to each other is simply by kind of gauging this SUN global symmetry of the 3D CFT and making it the 4D gauge field. So then, but the, the 3D CFT, you can think of as being some complicated matter, which has some SUN global symmetry, so I can couple it by standard minimal coupling to the SUN gauge fields of the N equals 4 theorem. In this other scenario, the global symmetry is a little smaller, so some of the N equals 4 gauge fields would have directly boundary condition and you only gauge some subgroup, but um, that's why I didn't want to talk about it. You can also understand it, but it's a little bit more complicated. This is what I just said in words written in formula, right? So the 3D CFT that gives me some complicated partition function. In practice, I don't know how to calculate it, but it's there. And that 3D partition function, you can calculate as a function of the background SUN gauge fields, right? From the 3D point of view, SUN is some global symmetry. So you can turn on arbitrary background gauge fields for this SUN global symmetry and calculate the partition function as a function of these background gauge fields. In terms of the 3D partition function, now you can define what you mean by the 4D BCFD. The 4D BCFD is simply an integral over this gauge field that used to be a background gauge field, but now I promote it to a dynamical variable. I have the n equals four action, which does depend on that gauge field. And I take the 3D partition function as sort of my boundary action of um, the BCFD. And I just take this 3D partition function, I, I post process it, I take it as part of my matter action in this full BCFT partition function, where now A is a dynamical gauge field, so nothing depends on A anymore, I integrate over it. And in pictures, I can also draw this for you, but I told you the full BCFT is this brain sandwich with semi-infinite D3 brain sticking out on the end. If I just wanted to have the 3D CFT, basically what I would need to do is I take the semi-infinite brains, D3 brains, and I, I shut them off. I have them end on an extra stack of D5 brains, this extra stack of D5 brains would introduce some SUN global symmetry. And then simply removing this extra stack of D5 brains and letting this, these three brains extend to infinity is this process of gauging the SUN global symmetry. So the left picture has some 3D CFD with some SUN global symmetry. 
the right picture is a four dimensional B CFD with that same 3D CFD living at its boundary. And the coupling between the two of them is that gauge the global zone. Okay. So this was the you know, a, a perfectly string theory embedding of a you know, four dimensional B CFD with some interesting 3D boundary. What we now want to do is we want to get this out of string theory and then um, see what to do about it in terms of the intermediate. Range. So to find the string theory solution, let me first show you why this is hard, right? Um, the fact that 80 is five times as five is dual to n equals four zero mills. It's sort of from the geometry point of view, entirely trivial. It's sort of dominated by symmetry. I have an SO4 comma two conformal symmetry. I have an SO6 R symmetry. Then 80 is five times as five is the space time that has those isometries. If you try to play the same game here, you can easily see you're in trouble. At this time I have a, a B CFT rather than a CFT. So my conformal symmetry is that of a 3D CFT. So I only have an SO32 instead of an SO42. So I know in my bulk, everything going to be kind of written in terms of ADS4 slices, but sort of it's ADS4, no longer ADS5. The five brains broke the R symmetry instead of an SO6 R symmetry. You only have an SU2 times SU2 R symmetry. And the way the spin has transformed tells you that from the geometry point of view, you want an S2 times an S2. And now we can do a counting exercise. You have like four plus two plus two, that makes eight. So you're missing two more dimensions, right? And by symmetry, nothing can depend on the coordinates and ADS four times as two times as two, but everything can depend on the coordinates on this remaining 2D space, which you know, sigma is just some 2D space, right? Some Riemann surface. And um, so my metric, my meta fields, like all the Ramon Ramon forms, the dilaton, the axion, everything you see floating around in type to be can be a function of two coordinates, right? So, so you're solving partial differential equations instead of ordinary differential equations. And they're highly nonlinear. Yes, you have supersymmetry, so they're first order only, but they're still an absolute nightmare, right? To begin with, you might think this is impossible. It might be impossible for mere models, but now that doesn't scare Michael Gutperl. He, the, the UCL group found the most general solution with that amount of supersymmetry and that particular global solution. It's not just a solution, but any solution you could possibly imagine with the symmetry has been written down in this paper. In particular, included in there is the solution um, that we want, the one for the stack of these three brains ending on like this quiver gauge to be made out of NS5 brains and five brains. This is roughly how it looks like. So I give you a picture of this Riemann surface sigma, and um, it has sort of, it's, it's some completely smooth geometry where on the right hand side, if I go far away to the right on the sigma, I see that I get something that's roughly ADS5 times S5. So that I call the 4D region, that's sort of n equals 4 super mills living on half space. If I go to the left hand side, you see that the internal space will shrink to zero. The spheres shrink to zero size and um, space shuts off. There's no brain there, right? Space doesn't end on the brain like in this bottom up RS setup, space just sort of smoothly caps off. There's no curvature singularity where the space caps off. It's like you know, how a, a cigar geometry caps off when the circle shrinks to zero size. Smooth space smoothly shrinks off as you go towards negative infinity along the Riemann surface. There's the boundary of the sigma. The boundary of sigma has nothing to do with the boundary of ADS5 space. It's a completely artificial device, but that's sort of where my five brain sources are sitting. Near the five brain sources, I have singularities. But these are just the standard, you know, the metric near a five brain. I know what happens at these singularities. This is where the five brain sources are, um, are hiding. And you know, sort of by specifying the singularity structure at the boundary of the sigma, you specify what sources you have in this geometry. In these brain sources, they're sitting on ADS four times S2. All fields are explicitly given in terms of a harmonic function H living on the Riemann surface. And you know, the details about the brains in the asymptotic regions are determined by this H. So any solution with this symmetry can be written this way, but you get different H's with different you know, boundary singularities for different geometries that you have. Right, so again, the first thing I will mention, the boundary of sigma is not the boundary of ADS5. The boundary of ADS5 is sitting to the right in this picture. You go to infinity, you know, to the right hand side to take this 4D region, you keep on working all the way to the right. So down here, I kind of try to illustrate to you what, what, what the bottom up picture to this would look like, right? So this geometry of sigma is supposed to correspond to what in this like naive random syndrome bottom up picture look like this geometry where to the right hand side, I have my boundary, which is 4D on the left hand side, space truncates instead of truncating on a brain, it truncates in some smooth geometry. 
So we no longer have a smoothly localized you know, brain on which I can identify perfect. Instead, I have some extended 3D region. I have some sort of region which corresponds to the end of space time where the internal geometry collapses. This is a solution to, of type to be supergravity. But in addition, this geometry will have uh, gauge fields living on ADS four times S2 because I need some explicit five brain sources. So you're going to have some SEM5 times SEM5 gauge group on ADS four times S2 corresponding to this five brain source. This corresponds to some extra global symmetry in my dual field theory. Right? I told you the 3D CFD has some SEM global symmetry, but that got gauged. But the full global symmetry is SUN times SEM5 times SEM5. And these two SEM5 factors I'm having here correspond to the remaining global symmetry, the one that didn't get gauged by the photo gauge. So if you look at this, you already see that this time it's it's even not clear what you would call the intermediate picture, right? And then before we had like a theory living on the brain that defined my intermediate picture and the intermediate geometry, but now the brain got replaced by some region, right? Where in this region does the intermediate picture live, right? I could any point in this orange region is like an ADS4, but which one should I choose? In this what justification should I somehow average over them? What's the effective 4D geometry? Where does this 4D, inter where's this 4D intermediate you know, series supposed to live? Right, that's sort of unclear. Um, you could say, well, let me look at this causality pattern and see how it could be solved. In fact, no matter what choice you make, there's like no way to kind of just identify a slice or an average slice and resolve the causality puzzle. You'll find uh, that it's exactly this, this, this fact that the shortcut depends on the distance traveled in the past. That tells you like really no matter how you define this YR, which is basically what all these different choices of picking a point or picking an average would boil down to. You always can kind of make YP big enough if you observe far deep down the past, none of these choices make any difference you always end up with the same causality violation. So the intermediate picture is usually presented seems to have serious problems from this point of view of the top-down geometry. So you might think just like, forget about it right now. Let's not, not let's just declare the intermediate picture dead and move on. I know there's, um, there's a lot of writing on this, you know, for some people more than for others, but it's also, you know, for some recent discussions, there's, um, now, people like page curves and people calculate a lot of page curves. Many of them work nicely in one plus one dimensions, but all the examples of page curves that people got in more than one plus one dimensions, they relied on this intermediate picture interpretation of Randall Sundon brain. And it would be a pity if we had, would have to give this up, right? We, we really want to use double holography to study page curves. So let's see whether we can do any better. What I'm about to present to you in my last 20 minutes is a way of making this work, of giving you a well-defined intermediate picture. This may not be the only one that works, but this is something that definitely works. It directly follows from the rules of ADS-CFT applied to the UCL solution. And by construction, avoids all causality problems. It's generally different from the naive intermediate picture of a graviton living on the brain, but so what? I'll argue to you that it has all the features that we need, and so it's just as good as any other you know, intermediate picture you might want. And to give you this, I want to go back to the basics. I promised you early on that this will become important. By the spirit of how we interpreted the intermediate picture, this is what we did. For if you were to start with the BCFT, if you dualize the entire BCFT, you clearly just get the bulk solution. But what this intermediate picture was supposed to do, you take this 4D BCFT and you only dualize the 3D degrees of freedom. That should define the intermediate picture for me. And instead of trying to, to find the intermediate picture somehow hiding in the geometry, I'm just going to do that, right? Um, irrespective of what the geometry wants or doesn't want to tell me, I can just define the intermediate picture by this procedure. Start with the BCFT, the BCFT has an explicit Lagrangian, and just apply the holographic dictionary to only the 3D degrees of freedom. That is a constructive way of defining an intermediate picture, and it doesn't have any sun. It, what this boils down to is kind of right, what we did so far is we took this BCFT, the sandwich with the insema infinite, the three brains sticking out, and we found you know, the geometry that corresponds to the full BCFT, and that's the holographic dual to the full BCFT. I call this sort of the true BCFT geometry. The geometry we've been studying so far as a holographic dual in terms of the full BCFT. What I'm going to do instead, I'm going to take this left picture, which is just the 3D CFT 
with an SGN global symmetry. That's the 3D BCFD, uh, the 3D CFD, the 3D CFD part of the 3D of this no BCFD. I'm just going to take just the 3D CFD and I'm going to write down a holographic tool for that. And I'm going to couple it by hand for n equals 4 to young mills without using geometry to describe n equals 4 to young mills. That will give me the proper intermediate fit. Again, I can write this down with formula. So here's the idea. Right? Again, as I told you before, the 3D CFD I can think of as a 3D partition function, which depends on some background gauge field A. And that 3D partition function becomes part of my definition of the full BCFD, where I then just in the end promote this to a dynamical gauge field and couple it to n equals four number. So what I'm basically telling you right now what you're going to do is you're going to use standard holography to make holography calculate for you that 3D partition function. I'm only going to apply holography to the 3D partition function. And in the end, I'm going to take this answer that came out of holography and going to couple it to n equals 4 to n minus out using holography for the full setup. I only use holography to calculate this one ingredient in my full partition. This way of describing it also makes it clear that uh, you know, there's some place where this intermediate picture is like practically useful. Right? Um, of course, these, you know, this, this double holography will work in principle for any value of parameters it's supposed to. Right? Holography is supposed to be true at weak and a strong coupling, but one or the other dual picture might be more useful. The 3D CFT is intrinsically strongly coupled. It doesn't have a free parameter like the coupling constant. The coupling constant you know, is flowing to infinity in 3D CFTs. So it's always best to use holography for the 3D CFT. But for n equals 4 0 mills, you have a marginal coupling constant you can dial. If n equals 4 to young mills is strongly coupled, you want to use what I call the true BCFT dual. You just want to dualize the whole thing and get sort of this ADS5, which caps off at one end. But if the n equals 4 to young mills is weakly coupled, this intermediate picture that I was just describing to you would actually be the most appropriate way of doing it. You get a strongly coupled 3D CFT, which you solve using holography, and then you can couple it in perturbations here, order by order, and the small coupling constant to n equals 4 to young mills. But it's not like you need to be in this regime to define the intermediate picture, but that would be the regime in which this intermediate picture I'm defining for you is actually calculationally useful. Where you use holography for the 3D part, 4D perturbation theory for the 4D part. Okay, so let's do this from the gravity point of view, right? So our task from the top-down perspective is that I now need the holographic tool for the geometry truncated by the five frames, rather than what I presented to you before, the holographic tool for you know, the sandwich with semi infinite discrete range sticking. And you know, the UCLA people did that too. So, this is like a project where, in the end, all you need to do is you flip to the right page of like Michael's paper. Um, and the geometry looks very similar. I have the same picture as before, so I can easily highlight the differences. Right? Before we had this asymptotic ADS5 region, this time the geometry caps off in that direction too. So, the geometry caps off both ends. There's some sort of finite bubble. In the middle, but the geometry shrinks to zero size, both to the right and to the left. We remove this asymptotic ADS5 region, no longer BCFT. But I had these brain sources that I had before, the N5D5 frames and N5 NS5 frames, but I added an extra ND5 frames, right? I had my field three had an extra ND5 frames, so I can truncate my D3 frames and I get some extra SEN global symmetry from the bulk point of view is telling me they have an extra ND5 frame source. Um, so this now looks much more like a standard warp compactification, right? This is space time has ADS4 times some internal space. There's S2 times S2, and then there's some sort of effectively compact direction, which sort of has the shape of an interval where space you know, truncates in both directions. And if I look at the, you know, what are the fields that are living in the bulk, you see explicitly I had to add an extra SUN gauge group living on ADS4 times S2, right? because I had to include an extra ND5 print sources in the bulk. From the bottom up point of view, this now looks much more like what people at not come to refer to as wedge holography, where now the space time actually ends on both ends, right? It's like if there were two RS frames, if you want to think of these shrinking regions as RS frames, my space time truncates at both sides, and this is not symmetric. Um, no, this, this right hand side came about from this extra end frames, and the left hand side came about from this N5 plus N5, NS5, ND5 frame. So um, this is our answer, and it has, I would argue to you, all the features 
an intermediate dual is supposed to have. Right? They have 4D gravity on ADS4 coupled to any conservative zero mills on, half, on a half space bars. Right? The gravion gets in bars, it gets a mass because it's still via this post procedure. At the moment I gauge this n equals four super mills gauge field, you can show by an explicit one loop calculation that the graviton will pick up a mass from that, from the coupling to the path. On ADS4, we have this maximal supersymmetric young mills living as well. We have SUN super young mills living from this gauge group on the five frames, which were living on ADS4 times SD. The only missing ingredient from the naive top down, from the naive uh, intermediate picture is there's no sign of a cutoff in the bulk, but that's just as well why we didn't really need that cutoff. Um, but it, no, is this maybe the same? Can, just can, I, can I ask a question here, Andres? Sorry, maybe yes. I, should, I should know this. Uh, so as you said, you can compute the mass via the one loop computation, but now are you in a situation where you can actually in, you know, in detail compare the one loop computation with something that you get from the five dimensional geometry? Or but the, the mass, you no longer see the mass from the 5D geometry, right? The 5D geometry looks because the holography only did the 3D CFD and the 3D CFD alone has a mass, no, a conserved stress tensor. So it's the, on ADS4, I get a massless gravity. And this I time, the mass doesn't arise geometrically, right? In this version of the intermediate picture, you don't see the mass in geometry. You see the 3D CFT in geometry. And the lack of conservation of the 3D stress tensor happens in this post processing, where by hand I gauge the 4D gauge field side. I see. It, I see. By I see. Point okay. of view, the mass is a one loop correction. I see. Okay. So there's no there's no computation to match, you're saying. No, no. The, I mean, you, you can still. What I'm about to tell you about page curves will also apply here, right? I can calculate the mass from the full BCFT tool by studying fluctuations there. I can calculate the mass in the BCFT by calculating an anomalous dimension of the stress tensor. And then I could match that mass against the one loop calculation. Mm. So, so this is sort of over Aroni and Adam Clark and I, we did a similar calculation where you kind of compare that one loop to a BCFT calculation. So I, yeah. I wouldn't compare geometry to one loop. I would calculate B. It's indirectly, right? In the BCFT, I can do a calculation of the mass by calculating an anomalous dimension. And I could independently compare this to 5D geometry or one loop and 4D geometry. But there's okay. no direct way of calculating the intermediate mass from a 5D geometry. Okay, okay, thank you. What I was about to say is trying to understand how different this is from what we had, right? Sort of, we have in the full PCFD geometry, I have like this brain, and I want to say the intermediate picture lives on this brain. Now I'm telling you the true intermediate picture involves this geometry, which has a second brain, but maybe I don't care. Maybe the geometry near this brain, near this region, 3D region where space ends, is sort of um, similar in the full PCFD and in the intermediate picture tool. And, and then I can kind of forget about this entire story and just happily do what I did before. So we can kind of look at deep inside this 3D region and compare the solutions deep in this 3D region, kind of compare the metric and see how similar are they. So here, a bunch of measures of how similar the metric are. I, the Ricci scalar in like either string or Einstein frame or ADS4 curvature radius in 3D uh, in either Einstein and string frame. And what I'm plotting here is the ratio of that these values, the, these quantities take in the two geometries, the true inter BCFT tool and our new intermediate geometry as a function of this parameter k over n5. And you see, you know, generically, they look nothing alike, right? These are order one ratios, so they're off by like 100%, except for when I go to this limit that k over n5 goes to zero. So when k over n5 goes to zero, the intermediate picture seems to be governed by a similar geometry near the brain as the you no know, true intermediate picture. So what is this limit k over n5 goes to zero? k over n5 goes to zero is the limit where the number of 3D degrees of freedom is much larger than the number of 40 degrees of freedom. So my 40 gauge group is SUN to be unmilled, which has like n squared degrees of freedom, but I couple it to a 3D CFT, which has way more than n squared degrees of freedom. The, the gauge groups on the 3D defect are much larger than the n equals 4 to be unmilled. From the bottom up point of view, this was this near critical limit where the brain got squished against the boundary. It's also the limit in which the shortcuts disappear. It's the limit in which the mass of the graviton scales to zero. Newton's constant also goes to zero, so I can't take the limit where k over n5 is strictly zero, but I can think of it as being a small parameter. And it was also the limit in which Noyan's fails construction was supposed to work. So there's maybe some hope. I don't have 
a positive answer to this, but since lots of people ask me about you know, how are you sure the naive picture doesn't work, maybe we can make it work. I think it's reasonable to suspect that the naive intermediate picture as always presented can be made sharper in this near critical limit where seemingly all these problems are either kind of, you know, are controlled by a small parameter. So one has an extra small parameter and even from the top down point of view, it looks like it doesn't really matter whether you use the full geometry or the naive geometry. I, I did, don't have an answer for this. This is sort of maybe something for the future. But no, again, our construction just works. Our construction works for any value of k, y, and five. We don't have shortcuts, and it's just um, no. It's one way of solving the problem is by kind of sidestepping it and in, instead defining this different version of this intermediate picture, which has a good top-down embedding from the very get-go for any value of k, y, and five. What about islands, right? I'm not gonna explain how to do islands with RS brains. This is like my one shot picture. If you wanna have more details on this, ask Subrat or kind of know. By, by now, we, I think the, the archive has been so saturated with papers on this that everybody has been at least exposed to this at some small level. Right? But for these island calculations, one is essentially, for reasons I will not explain, interested in the entanglement entropy of some sub-region out of the boundary, which one calls the bars which is sort of a sub-region far away from the interface. And if I want to calculate this entanglement entropy for this, I have two options. There are two RT surfaces in the bulk, one that goes straight down and hits the horizon and sees the growing space inside the black hole, the Einstein, you know, growing Einstein-Rosen bridge, that's the hartmann maldacena surface. Naively, this is a problem because entanglement entropy would grow forever. But fortunately, there's another one, there's an RT surface that ends on the brain. That's the island surface, it doesn't grow this time. So that gives me a unitary evolution of the entanglement entropy because things go to a constant. And then you would be saying the entanglement version of this radiation region includes this like part of the brain that's behind, hiding behind the endpoint of the RT surface. And that's then an island, part of the entanglement wedge. In, in, from the intermediate picture, right, where these are disconnected, I would find a disconnected part no, an entanglement wedge that belongs to this radiation region, but is completely disconnected from it as far as the intermediate picture is concerned. And sort of these double holographic islands are obtained in what I would call the full BCFT geometry, right? This geometry doesn't necessarily have a good 4D interpretation, right? I told you if you want to have intermediate picture stuff, you want to use our new construction. Here, one kind of looking at this brain and saying this brain has a black hole and has an island. Should I have done this? This sounds like I'm relying on the naive intermediate picture. What happened to all these island calculations? In fact, our claim is they aren't really affected. And that's because one can once again essentially cheat, right? Sort of, here's what you should do, right? You start with a black hole in the proper intermediate picture, right? What, what you want, if you want to understand the page curve of an evaporating black hole or no, more precisely black hole held in equilibrium with bias it's itself at a finite temperature, you should put the black hole in the intermediate picture geometry. The intermediate picture geometry is the one that involves 40 gravity on ADS4 coupled to a CFD. But then what you're interested in is so you're letting this black hole evaporate, its radiation escapes and makes it to the radiation region deep in the bars. So by that time, you can phrase what happened to this black hole in the intermediate picture as a calculation of an entanglement entropy of this radiation region in the dual BCFD. So you use the intermediate picture as an excuse of saying, if I calculate this entanglement entropy in the BCFT, that had something to do with the evaporation of the black hole in this proper intermediate picture, the well-defined one where I didn't study the black hole at all. Nobody has studied the black hole in the proper intermediate picture, but I know in principle I can do it. And that teaches us no, that that in the end becomes a question about entanglement entropies in the BCFT. But now this is a purely field theoretic question. And if I can't answer in the original tool, I answer in the other tool. Now I use the full BCFT geometry to calculate this entanglement entropy. So this proper intermediate picture, its existence tells me I can think of this entanglement entropy question in the BCFT as a question about a black hole in the intermediate picture. But to actually calculate it, I don't use the intermediate picture. I use the full BCFT tool. And I translate this calculation of the entanglement entropy in the classical RT surface calculation is described in the last slide. It feels like cheating, it is somewhat, and it makes it clear that one thing you shouldn't do, you shouldn't explicitly interpret things you geometrically see in the bulk solution. Um, you shouldn't take those literally, because not the true 
the bulk solution you're using is really dual to the BCFD. You shouldn't look at the 4D brain and say things that I see intersecting the 4D brain that has something to do with you know, where things are in the intermediate picture. So for example, in these pictures that I drew for you, the island will always extend outside the black hole horizon. And originally people made a big deal out of this saying, oh, surprising islands we saw in 2D are inside black holes here, they're outside black holes. Isn't this neat? I wouldn't take this necessarily seriously, right? Because that's sort of where you're looking at the full BCFT geometry and trying to interpret where things are in the full BCFT geometry in terms of what you would want to say about this intermediate picture geometry, which we haven't even used in this entire solution other than the justification that the particular quantity you're calculating the BCFT is an interesting one. There's some studies Christoph has done um, that if you actually look at this near critical limit where the intermediate picture is actually fine, the island, in fact, moves towards the horizon. So there's some indication that when you go to the limit, they actually can use this naive holographic, you know, the naive intermediate picture. It's in fact true that the island is no longer outside the horizon. So this is sort of one statement where you know, I would go from saying, we are sure the island is outside the horizon to saying, we don't know. This is sort of one of the results where you use the wrong geometric picture in order to extract that answer. Okay. I have two minutes left uh, and I'm done. No, uh, I, what I try to tell you is that using a top down embedding of you no know, BCFTs, you can derive a correct version of double holography, which sort of by construction is sort of um, three of any pathologies. But um, while the naive interpretation of like the, what people have done with bottom up holography seemingly needs to be modified, some of the key results about black holes survive. Because everything you can phrase in terms of a field theory question, you can then answer using the full BCFT geometry. Um, and the intermediate picture is sort of um, only needed to kind of motivate those questions as being interesting. Okay. Let me quit my talk and then hopefully you have lots of more questions so I get to hear something from you too. Uh, uh, thanks, Andreas, for the talk. Um, are there any questions? And maybe I, I can ask one about this last uh, these last comments on islands. So um, in, if you if you only do computations in the in the uh, full BCFT, then you're always going to get unitary solutions, unitary page curves, etc. Just because the BCFT is unitary. But I thought like the important piece of this uh, of this topography was precisely that then you could ask, uh, what's the rule I have to use to get back the same thing? In the intermediate picture, where I have actually geometry, etc., and that's the island rule. So, is that piece of the dictionary, is that piece of the computation, can it be saved somehow? Can you still do? Because otherwise, it seems uh, we're back to just ADS CFT is unitary. Yeah, I mean, at some level, by right, the, the way people set this up in the BCFT, the moment you phrase it as a BCFT question, you, you kind of know you have to get a unitary answer, right? Sort of the the islands are, as you said, that's the way of kind of expressing of how did the um, how did the intermediate picture know about this? Um, so, so, so for that, this is exactly one question where I feel like the calculations have been done kind of are subtle. It, for this, it would be desirable to have like you no, know, as many of you asked, kind of a, a definition of intermediate holography that's closer to um, no the naive interpretation. Yes, I. I it, it would be nice to have this. You know, this is something that does get lost in, in our definition. I defined for you a version of the intermediate picture that works, but it's hard to kind of say, ooh, the way this got solved is by the island rules and 4D. I, I would assume, assume that's how it gets solved, but it's harder to see. Thank you. Uh, if there are uh, Sorry, any one more question in this in this in the setup where you have you know the 4d weak uh, theory coupled to gravity in principle the computations that have been done in one plus one dimensions could be done in higher dimensions right you could try and do some replica trick kind of computation and try and uh, derive in this full picture as well right some some kind of island rule we assume maybe yeah uh, um i mean the replica trick works in any dimension yeah i i'm right so, so you ask me, can, can, can I imagine this being done? Yes, I can imagine this being done, but I don't okay. think it has to be done until somebody actually does it. It's kind of 
to see what problems would arise. Right. But yeah. Okay. Uh, are there any more questions? Uh, if not, yeah. Uh, thanks, Santias, for that talk. And thanks again for staying up late in the yeah. It's not that late, but no, at no, least thank, thank, thank you for getting up yeah. early, Andreas. <laughs> and I see you in like 15 minutes, Subra, right for our next meeting. Oh, are we meeting now? Oh, yeah. I, I see. think we're meeting with the Austrians today, right? I see oh, it. I see. Okay, okay, great. Bye. Bless, bless.